Welcome to episode 242 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to Julia Cowley, who served in the FBI for 22 years. Her first assignment was to the Boston Division, where she investigated white-collar crime, public corruption, and civil rights matters. Julia was then selected to join the FBI's Elite Behavioral Analysis Unit, the BAU, in Quantico, Virginia. In this episode, she reviews her detailed analysis of the then unknown subject referred to as the Golden State Killer and East Area Rapist. Between 1976 and 1986, this unknown individual was responsible for approximately 45 rapes, 12 homicides, and multiple residential burglaries in California in the Sacramento to Orange County area. As a member of the BAU, Julia joined the working group of local law enforcement agencies and FBI agents seeking to identify and apprehend this violent offender and create a behavioral profile to assist them in their investigation. 32 years after his last known brutal attack, Joseph James D'Angelo, a 74-year-old California man and former police officer, was identified as the serial rapist and killer and arrested. Julia's time in the BAU was followed by her selection to the FBI Laboratory Evidence Response Team Unit. She later returned to the Boston Division, Springfield Resident Agency, where she oversaw until her retirement, all federal criminal investigations in Western Massachusetts. Currently, Julia is an investigator in the Equal Opportunity Office at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is also the host of The Consult, a brand new true crime podcast where she and former BAU colleagues examine behavior exhibited before, during, and after a criminal act. I hope you'll check out Julia's podcast. It's a fresh concept for true crime shows. Before we get to the episode, a quick note to my Reader Team members. I just sent out my monthly email on Monday, October the 4th. So if it isn't in your inbox, please go fish it out of your spam filter or promotions tab. This month, I wrote about when the FBI investigates fraud, and I review one of my favorite FBI featured films, Boiler Room. If you're not yet a member of my Reader Team, To join, there's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode. One last thing. As the FBI Agents Association's G-Man Honors Distinguished Service Honoree, love saying that, I invite you to join me in donating to the Memorial College Fund and the Membership Assistance Fund to assist children and spouses of fallen agents and those struck by unforeseen tragedy. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode for you to learn more about ways to donate, or you can text FBIAA to 50155. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Julia Cowley. Hey, Julia, how are you? I'm fine, Jerry. How are you? I am excellent today. I think this is going to be a fascinating interview. Everybody has heard about the Golden State Killer. When you listen to true crime podcasts or you're into true crime television shows, you know about the Golden State Killer. But there were many, many people over the many, many years that he was out there that participated and helped in the investigation. And I think this may be one of the first times that you have been able to tell your story and the role that you played in trying to identify who this serial rapist and murderer was. That's true. This is my first podcast interview. In fact, I think it's my first interview ever about this case. 
I'm looking forward to talking about it and sharing my experience. Excellent. But before we get started on this case review, I want to share some really cool news with everyone. By the time this episode is posted, you would have launched your own podcast, The Consult. Tell us about it. Well, the idea of The Consult revolves around the consultations that I participated in as a member of the BAU. When cases were submitted to us, following an initial examination of the entire case file by the profilers, a consult would be held. And these consults tended to be informal with the lead investigators presenting all of the available facts and evidence of their case, and then the profilers offering all of their observations and opinions. And there was always a lot of very interesting discussion. Sometimes there were disagreements, but in the end, it was the investigators who would decide what was useful to them and what was not. The consults were some of the best times in my career. I'm doing this podcast with three of my former colleagues. It's a way for me to continue the work I love with the people I love working with. Well, I will make sure to put a link to your website for the consult so that everyone who is listening to this episode will also check out the consult. So let's get started on this case review. I have already read your bio, but I think it's absolutely necessary to just talk a little bit more about where you were when you were first given this assignment. I got involved in this investigation in 2011. And at that time, I was the most junior profiler in the behavioral analysis unit, or the BAU as it's known. And I was assigned to the crimes against adults unit. And one day, my supervisor called me into his office, and he'd asked if I'd ever heard of the East Area Rapist original Night Stalker, because it was a case that had come in, and he wanted to assign it to me. And you and I talked earlier about his name, and this offender uh, had many names. And to avoid confusion, I'll, I'll explain that, because before he was known as the Golden State Killer, he was known as the East Area Rapist for the sexual assault he committed in the Sacramento area from about 1976 to 1979. And he was also called the original Night Stalker. And he was known by this name for the homicides he committed in Southern California from 1979 to 1986. And when the rapes and murders were eventually linked by DNA, I think that was in 2001, they knew they had the same offender, that he was responsible for all of these crimes. And accordingly, he was called the East Area Rapist, original Night Stalker, or Eron's for short. And that's how I knew him, Eron's. It was Michelle McNamara, and she was a true crime author, and she dubbed him the Golden State Killer in an article she wrote for LA Magazine in 2013. And this is the moniker that most people have come to know him by. But it's confusion because, as you said, you were in Sacramento and you didn't even realize the Golden State Killer was the East Area Rapist. And you were familiar with the East Area Rapist. And now you know it's one and the same. Yeah, I just learned that the last couple of days preparing for this interview. And actually, I lived in Rancho Cordova, which is where his very first rape occurred. So what do you want to call him during our conversation? I usually call him the ear or earons. I can't help it. That was the name I knew him by for so many years. And that's what I called him. I think the Golden State Killer is a suitable name because it kind of captures the fact that he killed all over the state of California. And it sort of encompasses all of his crimes. But it's hard for me to get used to calling him that. And that's what so many people know him by. I mean, that's why he was famous. Because of the reporting Michelle McNamara did on this case, including a book titled I'll Be Gone in the Dark, she drew a lot of attention to the case. And investigators were always working on this case. They were never not working on it. And I know that because I was part of that for a time. But the attention she drew by that book, and it's a, it's a great book. It's very well written. For your true crime fans out there, if they haven't read it, I highly recommend it. 
They probably already have, but she did draw a lot of attention. But again, I still think a lot of people don't realize he is the East Area Rapist and he is the original Night Stalker. And that's not to be confused with Richard Ramirez, who was the Night Stalker. And when they realize, oh, wait, this guy committed crimes before the Night Stalker, they called him the original Night Stalker. So <laughs> lots of different names out there for him. At one point, he was called the Diamond Knot Killer for the way he knotted some bindings. It turned out it wasn't a fancy knot of any kind. He flew under the radar because of all these different names and because he moved around a lot. Well, what kind of information did they give you when this case was assigned to you at the BAU? They gave me everything. And I had heard of the Eron's because I had been following it for many years. I'd seen a special on a and E. I I think it was back in 2004. I know I was on maternity leave and I was watching a documentary on the case. I just became fascinated and, and I started following it. So when I got involved in this case, and I, I think, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, working at the BAU is super exciting. And it is to some extent, but not in the way that is portrayed on TV or the movies. So much of the work is sitting at your desk, you know, reviewing case files. And in this case, I probably reviewed 15,000 pages, at least of documents. I've reviewed everything, every incident report, every interview report. I examined all the crime scene photos, all the lab reports, I also went out to California and met with investigators from you know, 15 different agencies and visited all the neighborhoods where these crimes took place. And what was interesting, with few exceptions, in terms of the houses, the neighborhoods pretty much looked the same as they had 25 to 35 years prior when he was committing his crimes. And at that time, the neighborhoods were mostly white, middle class, low crime areas. And almost every home he broke into was a single family ranch style house. So that's where I began. One of our VICAP analysts, crime analyst Stacy Atkinson, had put together like a database, VICAP, where all of the reports, all the jurisdictions could upload their reports. And all the jurisdictions could read each other's files. And this was the first time that had ever been done, that everybody got on the same page. The, the working group could look at what all the other jurisdictions had in terms of evidence. I jumped in and just started to review all these things. Well, let me ask and, you this, because this, yes, again, you're talking, what did you just say, 2011? Yes. And the rapes had occurred from 1976 and 1986. Had anybody asked the BAU to take a look at this guy before? And what, I guess we should also answer the question as to what it was that they wanted from you as a okay. profiler. Yes. So what is interesting is that because these cases hadn't been connected, there were two of the homicides that they thought were connected. They were in Southern California. I don't remember which ones they were. I think there was one in Ventura. I, I forget where the other one was. I think it might've been Goleta. And they thought they might be connected. And then one of the profilers, and this is back in the early 80s, looked at those two cases and did a very brief you know, crime analysis. So that was the only time that the FBI had looked at all these cases from a behavioral perspective. And when the Sacramento Division of the FBI, along with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, when they requ requested assistance from us in 2011, you know, they were looking for, you know, basically a profile of the offender who at the time was still unknown. They wanted to know who are we looking for? What are the personalities, traits, and characteristics? And I think, I think they felt this was like their last chance, a last ditch effort. Sometimes 
the psychics are consulted before the BAU gets consulted. <laughs> I did find that in a couple of cases. I, you know, some law enforcement agencies would would consult a psychic first. They were also looking for investigative suggestions, and and it's hard to do when you have a case that old. And they've done almost everything that they can. But what I will tell you is that I felt pretty good that this case was going to get solved someday because they had his DNA. And being a former chemist and a former forensic scientist myself, I always knew that it was going to be technology that was going to solve this case, not the behavior. And I knew the investigators knew it would be solved. But I think we all hoped that we could solve it before the offender died if he was even still alive. And I personally thought he was because statistically he should have been. So that's what they were looking for, a profile. And what did they know or what did they think they knew when you got all of these documents? I mean, had some conclusions been made? Because I think I read something in my preparation that they thought he might have been in law enforcement. Is that true? Some of the investigators thought he might have been in law enforcement. And I will tell you, there were a lot of different theories. As you can imagine, over the years, the number of investigators who worked on this case, the number of theories, there were many. Even in the face of very strong evidence that he might have had a certain characteristic, you had division among the investigators. They couldn't agree on anything. So yes, some thought, well, maybe he was in the military. Some thought maybe he had been a police officer. Others were adamant he was not. I can talk a little bit about some ransackings that occurred prior to the sexual assaults. And many investigators thought that those ransackings were done by the East Area Rapist prior to him moving up to Sacramento. But then you had the other side that thought, Absolutely, he was not responsible. And back in the day, the agencies were having public fights. They were articles about it, about the disagreement that your offender is not our offender. So these are all some of the questions, in addition to the profile, that I wanted to try to answer for investigators by looking at all the details of each of these cases, his behavior in every single detail of these cases needed to be looked at. And I needed to decide, okay, you know, what does this mean about him? Why did he do this? Why did he say that? Is he in the military? Is he a police officer? Why do I think that? Or why don't I think that? And I wanted to present to all the investigators and be the final word on that. And I certainly wasn't. Right after he was arrested, I ended up calling and talking to one of the detectives who had the opposite opinion than I had on something. And I called him. I said, do you believe me now? And he goes, well, it seems to be the case. Yes. <laughs> so still could say it, you were right. <laughs> you know, it was all in good fun. They had many questions and, and people were looking to me and there were also people very doubtful. You did not want the FBI or I, I wouldn't say didn't want the FBI, but really didn't have any faith in any kind of analysis or behavioral analysis. And in an example of that, what I think, and it was my perception anyway, and I told you about the A&E special that I had watched so many years prior and became fascinated with the case. And one of the detectives, Detective Larry Poole, and he was with the Orange County Sheriff's Department at the time, he was interviewed on that show. And so many years later, I show up at the, the working group meeting and we go around in the room and introduce ourselves. And I recognized him and part of me just realizes how important this is to all these people. This is how long he's been on this case. And this is how much it means to him. But I remember he introduces himself and then he looks over across the room at me and he said, I'll be very interested to hear what the FBI has to say, if they're even willing to offer an opinion. <laughs> and and so, you were there. So of course, <laughs> you're going to offer. An exactly, opinion. exactly. But he was skeptical. I think he was skeptical. And I don't, you know, I thought, well, maybe he had another experience where the FBI didn't share information or something like that. And and so I just took it with a grain of salt. But once once they came around to me, I introduced myself and I looked over at Detective Poole and I said, I'll tell you what I think. I'm not afraid to tell you what I think. And he looked back at me kind of like, okay, then (laughs) I can't wait to hear what you have to say. And he was one of the people that over the years, I discussed this case with a lot There were so many, in addition to Detective Poole, that spent their lives and their careers on this case. 
Another one I'd like to mention is Deputy Sheriff Paige Nealon with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. She spent eight years of her life on this case and was really instrumental as well, getting me all the information that I needed to do the analysis. So many in all of these different towns and jurisdictions, I I don't even know if I could name them all. It was important. It was an important case to all of them. And despite it being called a cold case and some of it, you know, not being as notable as maybe some other serial cases, nobody ever gave up on it. I'm making the assumption that everybody knows the crimes. Everybody knows the time period. Everybody knows the scenarios. And, you know, I try not to go into gory details, but in case there are people who are listening who have no idea who the Golden State Killer is, we probably should talk more about what it was that you knew at the time. What was the information about his crimes that they were aware of and, and you know, what kind of suspects they had and just kind of give us a nice summary of the case as you knew it when you began working on it. Before I give the case summary, I'll just answer one of those questions, what kind of suspects they have. They gave me a list of 8,000 suspects. <laughs> so all you needed there were to a do lot of was suspects. just narrow that down, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my job is to come up with a profile so we can weed out maybe you know a few thousand of those, but that, that was their list. So that kind of tells you how hard they had been working on this. And, you know, it was sort of in all different directions. I have to ask you this before we go Mm -hmm. on. Okay. Was the actual perpetrator in that original list of 8,000? He was not. Wow. No, was never on the radar. But yeah, I can go over and, and give a summary of the, the crimes and the ones that I looked at. But before I start with the sexual assaults, I'll go over the series of, it was approximately 120 residential burglaries, and they occurred in Visalia, California, which is approximately three and a half to four hours south of Sacramento. And these burglaries started in 1974 and ended in December of 1975, shortly before the East Area Rapist began his attacks in the Sacramento area. And the offender in these burglaries became known as the Visalia Ransacker. So there we have even another potential name for the offender. And the reason I'd like to start here is because, as I had mentioned, so many of the investigators thought that the Visalia Ransacker was also the Golden State Killer. But, you know, there was not a consensus. There were other investigators who were convinced they were not the same person. And this had to do with the fact that there were so many different descriptions of this offender, so many different people who thought they saw him or might have saw him and and all the different composites are all completely different. And if you do a Google search on the internet, you'll see how many different composites there were. So I'll have a few of those in the show notes for this episode in case anyone wants to take a look. The description of the Visalia Ransacker, and I do believe a couple of people really got a good look at him. So I always thought the Visalia Ransacker might be a more accurate representation of him at that time. But the Visalia Ransacker composite looked very different from the composite that was made of the East Area Rapist. And so investigators were convinced they're not the same person. And I also think that for some investigators, it was difficult for them to believe that the Visalia Ransacker could make such a leap from being a burglar to being a rapist. So I felt this wasn't a question that I really needed to answer for them. You know, did the Golden State Killer get his start in Visalia? You know, just a little bit about the ransacker's crimes. He would break into unoccupied homes. Usually it was during the day when the families were out. And as his name suggests, he ransacked the homes extensively. He was throwing mostly female clothing about the houses. He stole a variety of items such as money and jewelry, photographs, pantyhose, lingerie. Sometimes he would stack items on the doorknobs to be alerted if anyone came home. The early burglary reports that I read, they were fairly short, sometimes a couple lines, uh, and they didn't have a lot of details. But there were a few things that I noted that I thought were interesting. You know, for instance, he left his fingerprints in lotion at one of the scenes. 
And then a bottle of lotion was found at another scene that did not belong to the victims. And yet another victim reported her beauty cream had been stolen. I thought this was evidence that he was possibly masturbating at these scenes. And at the time, I don't think the responding officers were aware of that, but they did make notations. So I thought potentially that could be an indication that there was a sexual component to these crimes. And I will elaborate more on that when I talk about the analysis that I gave. These crimes were a real nuisance for the Visalia community, but nobody had ever been hurt. And the community wasn't living in fear like you know they did when, you know, when the crimes were happening up in Sacramento. But that did all change on September 11th of 1975. And this case did take a deadly turn. It was approximately two o'clock in the morning, Beth Snelling, and she was 16 years old at the time, was asleep in her bed when the offender sat on top of her. And he told her she was going to go with him. He told her not to scream or he would stab her. So he forced Beth out of her bedroom into the family room. And as she struggled, he pulled out a gun and threatened to shoot her if she kept struggling with him. And then he forced her out of the back door and into the carport area. And hearing the commotion, her father, Claude Snelling, and he was a professor at one of the local colleges, he ran out and yelled something to the fact, you know, hey, what are you doing with my daughter? And the offender immediately turned and shot Claude twice. And he then turned, he pointed the gun at Beth, and he didn't shoot her, but he just kicked her several times in the face. And then he fled. Unfortunately, Claude died as a result of his wounds. And forensic testing determined that the gun that was used to kill him had been reported stolen during one of the residential burglaries. So the Visalia ransacker had become a murderer at that point. As a result of these burglaries and the murder of Claude Snelling, the Visalia Police Department increased their patrols. A few months later, December 10th of 1975, a police officer named Bill McGowan was on a stakeout and he spotted a prowler peeping in windows. Officer McGowan confronted the suspect, and he had his flashlight out, had his gun out and gun drawn on the suspect. And the suspect looked right at McGowan and begged the officer not to hurt him. And he was screaming over and over, oh, my God, oh, my God, don't hurt me. And McGowan described his voice as being very juvenile and effeminate. And the prowler screamed, I give up. See, see, I've got my hands up. I've got my hands up. But McGowan reported that the suspect had his right hand up, but his left hand was inside his jacket. And then he quickly pulled out a gun and fired one round at McGowan that struck his flashlight, luckily. And McGowan fell backwards and the suspect fled over a fence. This was the last time the Visalia ransacker was ever seen. And then the East Area Rapist strikes in the Sacramento area and then goes on to commit upwards of 45 home invasion sexual assaults in the Sacramento area, Stockton, Modesto, and then the East Bay areas of California. And you mentioned that these were about four hours north of Visalia? Yes. So he goes up, he's in Visalia, well... The ransackings are about four hours south of Sacramento. So that's that's the distance. So they don't overlap. The burglaries stop and then the rapes start. How many burglaries? Do you have any idea? I think just over 120 wow. burglary reports that I reviewed. And I think I had every single one of them. It, they were numerous. And these were from, you know, over a couple year period. He was very prolific. And then, of course, you know, killing Claude Snelling, he's become a murderer. When he goes up to Sacramento, his crimes up there were were unique. They were, he had a very unique MO. There was very little variation in his behavior. And when I would read those reports, it would be like the first sentence or two. And I would be like, yep, this is him. I knew, I would know it was him immediately. And I think all the officers were like, yep, this is an ear attack. And he would enter the residences through like unlocked doors or windows, or he would pry open the doors or windows. And occasionally he'd break through a window and reach in and open the door. And in a few cases, investigators believed he'd actually entered the residences prior and unlocked a window in preparation for returning later. He was a very skilled burglar. I felt he had done this before. He was very good at it. And he always entered late at night or early morning, surprising victims, often while they were sleeping. 
He'd wake them up by shining a flashlight in their eyes to temporarily blind them. And he'd repeatedly threaten them with a knife or gun. And he would tell them that if they moved or made a sound, he would kill them. And in some cases, he would threaten to cut off the ears and fingers of the female victims. And if there were children in the home, he'd threaten to do the same to the kids. I mean, it's just terrifying. Just imagine being woken up in the middle of the night like that. And he always tied up his victims. You know, he'd bind their hands behind their backs and then he'd bind their feet. He'd often use shoelaces, which he'd either brought with him or he removed them from the victim's shoes. In other occasions, he would use a rope or twine. Every victim was bound. And then after about 13 reported attacks in the Sacramento area in February of 1977, there was an 18-year-old young man, Rodney Miller, and he was home with his family and he heard something in the backyard. So Rodney and his father go out to investigate and they see the shadow of a man and they chase him. And the prowler is very fast, jumps over a fence, but he falls down. And then just as Rodney is going over the fence, the prowler shoots him in the stomach. And then he shoots at Rodney's father, but he misses. And then the offender took off running. And luckily, Rodney survived his injuries. And he went on to be able to tell people how he almost caught the East Area Rapist. But I mean, as you can see, I mean, he's become extremely dangerous. He's willing to kill immediately if needed. Is he ransacking these houses also? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He would enter the homes. He would go through all of their homes, opening drawers and cabinets, repeatedly going back in and checking on the victims. I mean, he he did this. It was a, a ritual for him. If he sexually assaulted the woman, he would always ransack the house first. He never sexually assaulted any woman without ransacking first. And he, you know, he'd move through the houses, loudly opening and closing drawers and cabinets. He rummaged through their kitchens. They're tied up at the time, knowing he's still in the house and not knowing what he's doing. And oh, I I, just the fear that they They, they can hear him. You know, the victims all hear him. He was very loud. He would make loud, exaggerated gulping sounds, you know, when he was eating or drinking their food. And he did, he ate their food, he drank their food, empty soda and beer cans were found at several scenes. Many times he would indicate he was gulping down pills or medication that he found in their homes. And when he was with the victims, often he'd demand you know, money and and jewelry and drugs. And that's, you know, where, where, where are the drugs? Where's the money? And he'd say things like, I need a fix, I need a fix. And so he'd pretend to gulp down these pills. And it was terrifying. And they could hear all of this going on. What was especially unique is that when he first began these sexual assaults in the Sacramento area, he entered homes when only females were present. However, this is right after the Rodney Miller shooting. And he attacked a female male couple for the first time. And when he victimized the couples, he engaged in similar behavior as he displayed in the earlier assaults of only females. He'd awaken them with the flashlight, threaten to kill them. He'd order the female victim to bind her male companion. He would then bind the female, after which he would then retie the male. Interestingly, he'd place fragile objects such as dishes or cups and saucers on the backs of the male victims, telling them that if they made a sound or moved, he would hear them and the items would fall and he would return to kill them. You know, as I mentioned, after tying up the victims and before committing any sexual assaults, he always ransacked their homes. He never ever sexually assaulted a female without ransacking the home first. Multiple assaults, ransacking in between. This was a key component to his crimes. And then another thing I noticed is that in all of these cases, when there was a female and male present, the offender, he always separated the female from the male and took her to another room to sexually assault her. He never assaulted a woman when the male companion was in the same room. Many of the male victims reported that he would return several times to check their bindings and would sometimes tie additional bindings around their wrists and ankles. And he would press a gun or a knife to them and repeatedly threaten them with death if they moved or made a sound. 
On several occasions, he made references to being in the military and boasted of his many sexual conquests while he was in the army. And, you know, as we discussed earlier, this was one of the reasons why many investigators believed that he had been in the military and he was being moved from military base to military base. And that would explain why he committed crimes in so many different jurisdictions. Again, another question I wanted to try to answer for the investigators. So he goes on to commit more attacks through 1977 and early 1978, all exactly the same as the ones I've described. Very similar, (laughs) hardly any variation to anything that he did. But then on February 2nd of 1978, at approximately 9 p.m., there was a young couple, newlyweds Brian and Katie Maggiore, and they were out walking their dog when they were shot to death. And they were found in the backyard of a house that was located, you know, right in the East Area Rapist hunting grounds, you know, where all these other crimes were occurring. A pair of shoelaces was also found in the backyard, which made investigators believe the victims may have encountered the rapist and perhaps confronted him. Brian was a sergeant in the Air Force. In fact, he was security police. And those who knew him said he likely would have confronted the prowler. So it's likely he confronted them and they they were both shot and killed. And and Brian was shot at close range in the upper chest. It appeared Katie had run from him and he caught her before she could get out of the gate. The backyard was fenced in and she was trying to get through a gate. And he caught her and then he shot her in the top of the head at close range. After the murders of the Maggiore's, Uh, There were 14 more attacks in 1978, but the offender moved out of Sacramento and he'd headed southeast, striking in Stockton, Modesto, and then he bounced back and forth between Davis. And then he headed southwest and he struck in San Jose, Concord, and Walnut Creek. And, you know, while his mobility had become more prominent, everything else remained the same with each case, again, exactly the same as the one before it. And in 1979, six additional attacks occur in as many months. And in March 1979, the offender headed back to Sacramento. He struck there for the last time. And then he struck in Fremont and bounced back and forth between Walnut Creek and Danville. And these were the last attacks known to be committed by the offender known as the East Area Rapist. And so this is upwards of 45 sexual assaults. And then you have an attempted murder and murder. So, I mean, he's just wrecked havoc on this community and they're living in fear and people are buying guns and women are taking self-defense courses and they're having community meetings. And, and then he stops. And then none of the victims, you know, they never got a good look at him because he wore a mask. He blinded them with his flashlight and blindfolded them as well. But he was generally described as a white male in his 20s or 30s, approximately 5 feet 9, 5 feet 11. Very general, not very helpful. But victims thought he tried to disguise his voice by talking through clenched teeth like he was trying to sound tougher. And victims also reported the offender used lotion or some other kind of lubricant during the sexual assault. So a similarity to another similarity to Visalia, the use of lotion or lubricant, perhaps. And then one thing that was also noted by almost every female victim was the offender had a very small penis. And this was in multiple reports that I read. And for this to be an observation by so many of his victims, I thought it was probably abnormally small and a real issue and fixation for him. This was the one thing that I felt was very consistent. The other descriptions of him, you know, nobody really ever saw him, but that was very, very consistent. The crimes up in Northern California and Sacramento stop, but now I want to go over a case that I think was a real turning point for the offender. Because after this, he never left anyone alive again. 
And this occurred on October 1st of 1979. And it's about three months after the last known sexual assault. So this incident happens in Goleta, California, which is in Santa Barbara County, almost 400 miles south of Sacramento. And the female and male victims were sleeping in bed and they're awakened by a flashlight shining in their eyes. He threatened them with a knife saying he would kill them and slit their throats. And he repeatedly asked where the money was. And they noted he spoke through clenched teeth. And exactly like the Sacramento and Northern California cases, the offender demanded the female victim tie the male's hands behind his back. He then tied the female's hands behind her back. And then he tied the ankles of both. And he roamed through the house, opening drawers and demanding to know where the money was. Very similar (laughs) as the other crimes. He returned to the bedroom four or five times before untying the female's ankles and taking her to the living room under the guise of wanting her assistance in finding the money. So the offender placed a pair of shorts on her head as a blindfold, and he forced her down on the living room floor and retied her ankles. And she could kind of see out of the shorts, and she could see that he was shining a flashlight like up and down her body. And she could also hear that he was rubbing his clothes and she suspected he was masturbating. He then left, you know, and began rummaging through the house again. And he returned to the female victim and he said he was going to kill her and he was going to cut her throat. And he then left again and began opening drawers and cabinets in the kitchen. She could hear him saying over and over again, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. And she thought he was working himself up and she really thought she was going to die. And at one point, the offender left and walked down the hallway, and she saw this as an opportunity to escape. So she started, she got up, she started hopping toward the front door. As she did so, the bindings came off her feet, and she ran out of the front door, and she was screaming. And the offender chased her, and he caught her, and he pulled her back into the house, retied her feet. But after hearing his girlfriend scream, the male victim thinks she's being killed, He hopped out of the back sliding door and across the patio into the backyard, and he hid in some bushes along the fence line and yelled for help. And one of the victim's neighbors was an FBI agent named Stan Los, and he was in bed when he heard screaming. He called the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department, and then he went outside And that's when he saw the offender fleeing from the victim's house on a bicycle. So Agent Los jumps in his view car chases the offender and loses him when the offender dumps his bike and flees on foot. And it was later determined that the bicycle had been stolen from a house approximately half a mile from the victim's home. He really botched this case. You know, he had one victim running out the front door, another victim running out the back door. He gets chased. He lost complete control. And I don't think he was ever going to let that happen again. And as I mentioned, after this, no one that we know of ever survived an attack again. Wow. Did you know Stan Los? No, I didn't know him. But he would have been in Santa Barbara, though. Yeah, this is in Santa Barbara County. Yeah. yeah. The coincidence of living next to an FBI agent. Wow. Yeah. And then three months later, on December 30th, he struck in Goleta again. And this time he killed Deborah Manning and Robert Offerman. And Deborah was 35 years old and Robert was 44. And Deborah was found lying face down in bed and she had been shot once in the back of the head. Her arms were behind her back and bound at the wrist with white nylon twine. Her legs were not bound and she was not sexually assaulted. But Robert was found on the floor at the foot of the bed, and he had been shot three times, and he was clutching the same twine that had been used to bind Deborah's wrists. So it appeared that he had been able to get out of the bindings before the offender had finished binding Deborah and get off the bed. And when he did so, the offender immediately killed him and then shot Deborah and fled without ransacking, without committing any sexual assault. But then he goes on to kill Charlene and Lyman Smith in Ventura. And both of them were bludgeoned and Charlene was sexual assaulted. There was evidence of extensive ransacking in their home. He then goes on to kill Keith and Patrice Harrington and Dana Point. They're found on August 21st, 1980, both bludgeoned and Patrice was sexually assaulted. They find Manuela Whithoon in Irvine on February 6th, 1981. She was sexually assaulted and bludgeoned. 
at the time, her husband went into the hospital unexpectedly. So he would have otherwise have been home with her, but she was home alone that night when she was killed. And then he kills Sherry Domingo and Greg Sanchez, also in Goleta on July 27, 1981. And Greg had a non-fatal gunshot wound to his cheek, um, but he died of 24 blows to the head. And Sherry was sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death. And after this, almost five years go by and there's nothing until Janelle Cruz was found murdered in her family's home in Irvine on May 5th, 1986. And she had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. And at the age of 18, Janelle was the killer's youngest victim. And she was also his last. And we don't hear anything again until Joseph James D'Angelo is arrested by the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office in April of 2018. I found out on Twitter, the true crime author Michelle McNamara was married to comedian actor Patton Oswalt. And he tweeted the arrest of the Golden State Killer. And I just happened to follow him on Twitter. And that's how I heard about it. I knew something was going on, but I didn't know specifics. And that's how I I found out that morning. And I was calling around trying to get confirmation. Because once you do the profile, you're not really involved in the investigation anymore. You know, it's kind of a myth that the FBI comes in and takes over, but, but we don't. It's their case. It remains their case. We're there to serve as consultants. Once we're, we're done with that, we're not part of it. We're usually not part of, you know, conducting interviews or interrogations or surveillances or anything like that. So that's how I found out about it. And he was identified as a suspect through forensic genetic genealogy and confirmed the Golden State Killer by DNA analysis. And they arrested him at his home in Sacramento, which is right in Citrus Heights, which is an area of Sacramento. He was living in one of the same neighborhoods he'd stalked and terrorized so many years earlier. Really amazing. He was a former, yeah, he was a former police officer, and he had been with the Exeter Police Department from 1973 to August 1976, which is about 15 minutes from Visalia. And then he moved up to the Sacramento area where he was a police officer in Auburn from 1976 until 1979. And he was fired from the Auburn Police Department after he got caught shoplifting. Yeah. And I noticed in preparing for this, the items that he was shoplifting might have been earlier clues if somebody had suspected that he might have been involved in any type of rapes. And it was, what was it? Dog repellent and something else? And a hammer. And a hammer. Right. He he was, yeah, potentially. I mean, you know, looking back, those are, those were signs. But yeah, he shoplifted dog repellent spray and a, and a hammer and ended up getting fired for that. So if you'd like, I can go over, you know, the analysis that we gave in 2012, prior to his capture, you know, now that we know who he is, we can compare that, you know, to the actual offender. That's always interesting to do, go back and see, you know, what did I get right? What did I miss? And why did I miss it? And how can I improve? So I I always like to do that. I mean, obviously, I don't want to miss anything. But there's always stuff you don't see, especially in a case that's this big. And, you know, so many different victims and incidents. I think Um, that would be fascinating to do. Well, I'd like to start with the victimology. And I think it's important to understand the complete picture of these crime victims, because the more we know about the victims, the more we know about offenders. And often I think investigators don't do enough victimology because they don't want to ask sensitive questions and appear like they're blaming the victims. But those things are really important to know, because I I really do feel like if we know these things about the victim, we can make observations about the offender and the type of offender, what the victim's risk levels are, or how they were chosen, or how they might have reacted to a confrontation with an offender. And that, that tells us so much about who we're looking for. So I think victimology gets overlooked. In this case, actually, I thought victimology was much easier to look at because I looked at it collectively and we didn't have to like piece everybody's life together. And there weren't a lot of details 
particularly about the rape victim's life. So I had a lot more details about the homicide victim's life, but collectively, I thought the victims could be described as living a low risk of violent crime victimization. You know, they were all respectable members of the community. They were living without significant or apparent conflict. And none of them were noted to have engaged in significantly risky behavior that would have enhanced their likelihood of becoming victims. And there was nothing discovered in the course of the investigations to support that any of the victims were selected based on a prior interaction with D'Angelo. I thought these victims were chosen because of where they lived. They lived in his chosen hunting grounds, you know, areas that were familiar to him because of his considerable prior contact with them, you know, areas where he was confident and felt secure when offending. You know, they were available to him at the places and the times when he chose to commit his crimes and they were deemed vulnerable, you know, living in those one story single family homes. And they were desirable, you know, people he could gain and exert extreme control over. So that was my assessment of victimology. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the questions I wanted to answer for investigators was, was the Visalia Ransacker also the Golden State Killer? And at the time, you know, now we know that he was, but at the time, there was no doubt in my mind that they were one and the same person. And I do believe that the FBI, because of my analysis, put out a formal statement that the FBI believes (laughs) that these are the same offenders. Because I really felt if you can catch the person who killed Claude Snelling, you can catch the stereo rapist. Looking at these crimes, I thought that the behavior that was demonstrated in the commission of the Visalia crimes bore significant similarities to those displayed in the subsequent sexual assaults and murders. You know, on the surface, you know, Visalia burglaries may have seemed non sexual. And to, to many of the initial responders to these crimes, they just thought they were just random burglaries, innocent, just probably some kids. However, there were at least in part sexually motivated, and there were signs of that. While he did steal some things of value, he stole items of little value, such as photos and pantyhose and lingerie. He also engaged in behavior that did not facilitate theft, such as the scattering of the female clothing. In one case, he poured orange juice on a bed. He disassembled a padded bra. He would steal only one earring from a pair of earrings and he would move items, but he wouldn't take them. And I thought there were indications he was potentially masturbating at the scenes, you know, using the lotion as lubricant. These were sexual burglaries and material gain was not a prioritized consideration. Just on kind of a side note, when I would teach about serial sexual assaults, particularly home invasion, sexual assaults. When you have those types of cases, often investigators are looking for offenders who had prior sex crimes. What they should also do is include offenders who have prior breaking and entering crimes, burglary crimes, and trespassing. Now, people who have been arrested for those types of crimes as well, because what they found, there's been some research done, they found that a lot of serial sexual murderers actually started out as burglars. So I think it's important anytime you have one of those cases, you know, look for trespassing and burglary and are they, breaking Are they and trying entering. to work up their nerve to actually commit a violent crime? I think that's part of it. But I also think that in these sexual burglaries, and I think it's true in this case, and I can talk about it a little more, but there's a real need to look at and rummage through victims' belongings. And it's important that, you know, these victims know he was going through these things. And and in this, you know, this very particular case is why he was so loud all the time. You know, he was slamming the doors and cabinets. In, you know, Visalia, he left everything out for display. And he really wanted those victims to know he was going through it. And I think that there's this this urge and it's sexually stimulating for is it part of violating them also? Yes, absolutely. The Visalia burglaries, they they were numerous. 
you know, obviously characterized by the ransacking. And that was so prevalent. And it was very particular and similar and distinctive. And I thought for sure they were connected when I saw the makeshift alarms by stacking items on doorknobs and victims' backs. You know, that that was unique. He did that in, in both different cases. I also noted that in one of the Sacramento cases, he stole only one earring from a pair, as he'd done in Visalia. You know, you mentioned kind of the evolution. You know, is he building himself up for it? I think that's part of it. But I, I think that's just sort of where the, he starts. And it's really important. You know, his evolution from a burglar to a rapist and murderer did not eliminate his desire to occupy the victim's intimate spaces and handle their belongings. I mean, in every case, prior to any sexual assault, he ransacked the victim's homes. And several victims reported, you know, hearing him masturbate while he was doing so. In one case in Sacramento, and I, I did not talk about this, but I'll mention it now, he kidnapped a victim from her home and walked her about a quarter of a mile. And he stopped and he doesn't sexually assault her. And he says, this isn't working right. And then he just took off. And I thought that that was an indication that by omitting the ransacking, you know, his sexual arousal was inhibited. It just wasn't going to work. And, you know, the ransacking was key. And this is really important, too, for potentially linking other unsolved crimes to the offender where there isn't DNA. And I've heard a lot of talk about, you know, potentially he committed a crime here or there. And, and you know, my opinion is if investigators are looking to link any other sexual assault murder cases to D'Angelo, if ransacking was not involved, he likely wasn't the offender. It just was so important and so prevalent. You know, when D'Angelo was caught, he was confirmed the Visalia ransacker, and he did plead guilty to murdering Claude Snelling. And I think I was especially happy about the closure of that case because while I thought the rapes and murders would eventually be, be solved because they had the DNA, I wasn't certain that this one would be because there wasn't any physical evidence. It was only linked by the behavior. And, but the behavior was unique enough to make the associations to the others so they connected it to him. And plus, D'Angelo had been the police officer in a town only about 15 minutes away. So this was very gratifying to see that he was held accountable for Claude Snelling's murder. I, I always felt that Claude Snelling's murder was set aside because they didn't have the DNA. People weren't confident about that case. So it's really, you know, it, it's really nice to see that they were able to close that one as well by linking the behavior to him. His connection to military or, or law enforcement, was that part of your analysis? It is. And I certainly can talk about what I thought about his time in the military. And this is where, and I'll just talk about this first and get it out of the way, <laughs> because I think this is where I missed a little bit. And, you know, this is what you get when you assign a big case to a junior profiler. You're going to get, it's not going to be perfect. But as I mentioned before, like in several of the cases, you know, he claimed he was in the military and, you know, some investigators, you know, thought he was and that he was probably moving around California, you know, being transferred from military base um, to military base. And I thought he had a strong interest in the military and maybe had even enlisted. But I thought it was very unlikely that he had been in the military at the time of the crimes. And the reason why I thought that was because he did everything he could to disguise his identity. You know, he wore a mask. He disguised his voice. He blinded his victims with a flashlight and he also blindfolded them. And then he threatened to kill them if they ever looked at him. He pointed a gun to their head, knives to their throats. He did everything he could to avoid, you know, them discovering his identity or what he looked like or anything. And I thought that it would be unlikely he would have provided a personal detail about his life that could actually lead to his identification. So while he wasn't in the military at the times he was committing the crimes, I got that part right. He had been in the military prior. 
And he joined the Navy in 1964 and had served 22 months. And, and this surprised me because I actually didn't think he'd been in the military at all. As I mentioned, his crimes reflected such an emotional immaturity that I thought he was younger and wouldn't have been old enough to have served by the time the burglaries began in Visalia. You know, the lesson that I learned is that emotional maturity does not always correspond to chronological age. And, and you know, in the early days of profiling, you know, they would put age ranges on offenders and, you know, 25 to 35 years old. Well, by the time I got there, that had evolved and they were not putting chronological ages on anybody. And I did not put a chronological age on my report because what they found is that, you know, chronological age is so dependent on different things like people's maturity. It's really what you want to look at is their emotional age. And so like my bias sort of took over and I thought he would be younger. I thought he was probably going to be about 10 years younger than what he was. He was 72 when he was arrested. He was 28 when he began the Visalia ransackings. And I, I thought he was going to be about 18. So that's where I think I missed. I was like, oh, he's much older than I thought. And he had been in the military. But again, he's he's so extremely immature. And, you know, I, I'll talk about that. But I'll go, you had asked a question about whether I thought he was a police officer. What I thought and what I put in my report was that I knew he was very familiar and very proficient with firearms. And that was evident. He fired quickly and accurately, even when the targets were moving. And to do so, particularly in these highly stressful situations, requires a lot of practice. And I thought he had a strong interest in firearms and other weaponry and may have even had formal training in the use of firearms. And I will tell you in my draft report, I put he had law enforcement training. But the unit chief at the time, that made him nervous. He thought it was too strongly worded. So he made me take it out. In fact, he wanted me to take a lot of things out of my report that I didn't. But he, he did think it was too strongly worded and that I was going too much out on a limb on that. So I took that part out. But in any event, you know, I thought that people that knew him would be aware of his interest in firearms, his proficiency. And I thought, you know, he likely boasted of his abilities. I think that, you know, now that we know that he's a police officer, I'm sure that the control and authority and the power that's inherent in law enforcement was a major, if not premier attraction for him. It was compensatory for his inadequacies. I think it was also bound to have been disappointing to him to some extent. Internal chain of command likely would have been irritating to him and detract from the external power that he probably realized through interacting with the public. Again, being a police officer was likely satisfying enough to delay his really violent tendencies. It's very telling that the attempted murder case in Goleta, when the two victims were running out the house in opposite directions, that was the first case after he had been arrested for shoplifting. And he was fired from the Auburn Police Department later that same month. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I just think stress was getting to him and he had, you know, these botched attacks. And after that, his violent tendencies were just completely let loose. That was my thought on his being a police officer. And a lot of people think that, you know, because of the brazenness of his crimes, that he is a tough and secure and confident kind of guy. But I did not think he was a confident guy at all. I thought, you know, despite what he did, and, you know, just because you're an insecure person doesn't mean you're not dangerous. And sometimes insecure people are the most dangerous. You know, it's like a, a like a, a dog, you know, dogs become violent when they're frightened <laughs> and they're insecure. You know, I thought this was him. And I thought that he was engaging in these crimes to combat feelings of inadequacy, you know, and he had these fantasies of possessing power and toughness and the ability to intimidate others. You know, his related behaviors included like speaking through the clenched teeth and making gory, brutal threats like cutting off the ears and fingers of victims. 
claiming the military affiliation, claiming to have had sexual relations with so many women and while he was in the military, claiming to have engaged in illicit drug use and you know, engaging in these exaggerated animalistic behaviors, such as gulping food and drinks and pills. And I think he was gratified by exerting control over people. And he prolonged this by staying in their homes for hours. I mean, forced compliance and exerting his will upon others stimulated him. What I really tried to impart on the investigators, you know, his victim selection really reflected his interest in power and control. And he obtained power not only by forced sexual acts with female victims, but also by rendering their male partners powerless to stop him, forcing their helpless presence in the same residence in which he is violating their female companions. And it was my opinion that the male victims were central to his motivation and gratification, and they were not incidental obstacles. I think that was a a completely different way to look at the case than anyone had ever looked at it. And I really felt this was all about the men and his feelings of inadequacy, feeling intimidated by and inferior to and envious of other men. He very literally didn't measure up to them. And I thought he was jealous of them in terms of their masculine status, respect, and related benefits. You know, in one case, He had demanded a female victim put her legs around him, quote, as if I'm your husband. And I thought this reflected his jealousy and his crimes and were compensation for his insecurity. You know, he wanted to feel better, stronger, more intelligent, more sexually potent than other men. And part of the gratification stemmed from taking what belonged to other men from their possessions to control, to sexual access to their women. His inferiority complex, you know, might come into play in any potential interview. So I thought getting him to talk would have been a very tall order. People often think that serial killers want to talk, that they want to brag, you know, like Gary Ridgway, Green River Killer, or Dennis Rader, BTK. Not this guy. He is not the same as those other serial killers. And serial killers are not all the same. You know, he didn't feel confident and all powerful like these guys did. He felt inadequate and ineffective compared to other men. So the assumption might be that he shouldn't be interviewed by a woman because he raped them and therefore he hated them. But his real hate was for the other men, in my opinion. And there was no way that he was going to give the satisfaction of obtaining a confession to another man. I also think that any confession he gave would have totally exposed his inadequacies and shortcomings. And we know this has, you know, this bore out because Joe D'Angelo, he's never given a statement or answered questions about his crimes. That's fascinating. You know, I do want to go back just for a, a little bit. You talked about the fact that genetic genealogy was the way he was caught. You know, you had his DNA. How many times had they been able to collect DNA from him and in what situation? And you talked about him drinking beers and stuff like that. Did he wipe away his DNA or he left that there? I don't believe they had any DNA from the Sacramento scenes. I believe the DNA came from, I know, I know at very least there was DNA from the rapes that occurred in Contra Costa County. Those were connected to the homicides in Southern California. But I don't believe they ever connected Sacramento by DNA. They didn't have it, but they did connect the cases through the behavior, through his, you know, MO, and they were connected by that. You know, it was a crime analyst in Contra Costa County who eventually became like the, I think the head of the lab and became a cold case investigator. He got very interested in the case and was you know going through the files and and the evidence and found an item and i think it still had dna and he was able to get a profile he put it in the system and he matched it to i think one of the homicides and i think that was back in 2001 i may not have that 100% accurate but it was something along those lines and that's how they connected him through the dna fast forward many years later and we have these you know ancestry websites and 
there was profile that was submitted for him. You know, I think they did a, a fake account and they were able to match that to maybe some distant relatives. And then through just sleuthing through looking through databases and phone books and, and internet searches, they were able to come up with potentially two people that might have been related. And one of them was Joe D'Angelo, and he was living like right in the middle of where <laughs> these attacks occurred early on. And so they thought that he was likely the suspect. So I think they surreptitiously collected his DNA out of the garbage or something like that, and it matched. And then when they arrested him, they take his DNA again, and then they confirm that it's him. So that's how that unfolded. And and I wasn't part of that. Most of that, you know, I've, I've read about and the FBI had done some internal stories on our intranet that I was able to read how, how that was done. But the science always catches up. And I think everyone always knew it would someday. You know, I take comfort in the fact that there's a lot of killers out there that know someday that there's someone's going to knock on their door and they're next. You know, I like thinking that that all these killers out there and they know they're going to get caught someday and they they have to live with that. As part of my analysis, you know, I gave some investigative suggestions that I thought in the meantime, until the science catches up or till we find the right suspect that we get DNA from, in the meantime, you know, what can what can we offer to help? And what I did suggest, and the FBI ultimately did do this, maybe not to the extent I would have liked to have seen, but you know, I suggested they they create a website that was heavily advertised and they just put everything out there. I mean, there's there's nothing that should ever be held back anymore other than maybe victims names, but you know, they they have the DNA. This might be the last chance to ever catch him alive. What are we holding back? There's no need to hold him back. All we need is a name. So, my suggestion was, you know, list all the areas and dates of attacks and emphasize his connection to Visalia and, you know, provide a comprehensive and descriptive list of like everything that he took. He took very unique items. A family member might have come across it. You know, he took weapons and jewelry, jewelry with inscriptions. He took some class rings, you know, list the serial numbers, you know, any any of the engravings that might have been on this, you know, put that all out there so that somebody might say, "Oh yeah, you know, I was in Grandpa Joe's garage and I I saw this class ring that had this person's name on it. You know, somebody might have seen things. I also thought that, you know, they should highlight his unique behavior patterns, you know, that he he was muttering to himself, you know, especially when he was stressed. And, and I'll, I'll go back to that characteristic because that was something I thought was really a big part of his personality. And list all of the statements that he made. You know, he had a very unique way of saying things. You know, he would say things like in one in one case, he said something along the lines of, you know, within the next 20 minutes, you make one move and you'll be silenced forever and I'll be gone in the night. And, you know, if you say anything or flinch, I'll push the knife all the way in and be gone in the dark of the night. He made references of having a van. I think he actually made reference to living in a van down by the river. <laughs> he made references to seeing victims at local community colleges. And so I thought every single thing that he said, whether we believed it to be true or not, like all his military affiliations, anything he said, anything we know for a fact he told a victim, put it out there. But tell the public, this may not be true, but maybe you've heard someone that talks like this. And that's why, you know, I was happy to see Michelle McNamara's book and the title of it all be gone in the dark because you know that was something he said to a couple of the victims in that kind of weird way and so her book drew a lot of attention to that and drew a lot of attention to the way that he spoke you know I wanted them to highlight his interest in military and weapons and guns put everything out there that they could you know how to deal with media Jerry I wanted them to stress that because the investigators have his DNA that could either positively link him to the crimes or can exclude innocent parties, you know, members of the public shouldn't hesitate to provide the information, even if it's just a name. We just needed a name, get the DNA, rule them out. So that was my suggestions for in the meantime to help try to solve the case. And the FBI did put out, I think in 2016, and, and they did list a lot of the items that he stole. You know, I really thought that that was really the only thing we could do 
is just try to educate the public to everything he took, did, said, whether we thought it was true or not. And maybe somebody would recognize something, but the science caught up to him. I'll back up a little bit because I had talked about these odd habits he had in the muttering to himself. One of the things I also wanted them to emphasize in the media is that he would be noticeably socially awkward. You know, witnesses that saw him in Visalia, they described him as talking and muttering to himself. And rape victims had also reported hearing him mumble and talk to himself. But he was too prepared and adaptable to suffer from any significant intellectual disability. But I thought those who knew him or came into contact with him would consider him odd, particularly if they had a conflict with him. I thought they would notice these habits, such as talking to himself, because this was what he did under stress while committing these crimes. I didn't think that he was the type of person who dealt with things not going his way in a mature manner. And I thought these traits would be exacerbated, particularly when he was under stress. I've heard other profilers talk about other serial killers, and they said that if you sat down with them, you'd never know. And in the case of D'Angelo, I don't think people would automatically think he was a serial killer, but I think that they would sense something was off and may have been like frightened by him. Neighbors who had conflicts with him described him once they knew who he was, they described him as getting very angry, muttering to himself pacing around in his backyard saying, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. You know, that's what he did at one of the crime scenes. So perhaps if media had put that out there, that he said this, some neighbor would have said, and I'm not saying that that would have happened, but you know, you, you have to try. You never know. And yeah. you never know. And there's just there was just nothing to lose. He even left a death threat on those neighbors ans- answering machine. You know, another person had described him as not being very friendly and, you know, his nickname was Crazy Joe. I mean, this guy was odd. He wasn't like a normal guy that everybody was like, I'm so surprised. I think some people are like, well, yeah, he was kind of weird. We did notice that. I mean, yeah, yeah, well, he left a death threat on our answering machine. What job did he have after he was fired from the police department? Do you know? So we don't know for a long period of time what he did, you know, until about 1990. And I've read that he worked as a truck mechanic for like a grocery store for the trucks or, you know, some sort of distribution center or something like that. So, but up until about 1990, like from, you know, when he was fired, there's not a lot of information about that. Gary Ridgway, you know, described as feeling all powerful and, you know, all knowing and very proud of his crimes. And D'Angelo, he really lacked a lot of confidence, despite the fact that it seems like he's really brave. He's breaking into these homes. There's men in these houses. I mean, he must be like the toughest guy in the world. But, you know, if we look at his crimes, you'll see that he lacked confidence in his ability to engage in a physical fight with another man. You know, he was so hypervigilant. And he displayed this very excessive concern with his male victims. I mean, once he tied them up, he'd often retie them with additional bindings. And as an added measure, he'd put the fragile objects on their backs and he'd return, you know, several times as obsessively checking and rechecking their bindings. He kept them compliant using threats and threatening them with weapons and putting guns to their heads. And he always made excuses for separating the females from the males, you know, thereby mitigating, you know, the necessity of immediate action on the part of the male victim. I thought this showed how concerned he was with the possibility of being confronted by and overpowered by another male. You know, in situations where he faced imminent physical confrontation with a male, he engaged in immediate lethal force at a very high risk. You know, it's high risk to shoot. He might get caught. Someone might hear it. But we saw this, you know, we saw it with Claude Snelling, we saw it with Officer McGowan, Rodney Miller, the Maggiores, and Robert Offerman and Greg Sanchez, who were two of the male victims who escaped their bindings. I mean, he was absolutely nothing without his weapons and the element of surprise. We've talked about when he was caught shoplifting, the store clerks were actually able to subdue him and tie him to a chair until the police arrived. He's really not a tough guy. You know, when the sheriff's department arrived, he was crying and whining and he was a complete emotional wreck. 
he is, you know, not someone that handles these things well. Not what you think of when you think of a serial killer. Right. I mean, he he was aggressive in his own way, but he's not like others. Like, you know, he is a, he's an insecure person, insecure and ineffective and not a capable person in certain aspects of his life. A lot of people thought he was faking in court, you know, his mouth gaping open and looking like a confused and feeble old man. I actually didn't think he was faking at all. I thought that was the truest version of himself. Inadequate, insecure, ineffective. He completely implodes when his control is taken away. His arrest for these murders was the ultimate loss of control. And being in front of everyone, he was totally exposed. And this was his, this was a normal reaction for him. It's like when a young kid gets frustrated and they throw temper tantrums. They're not faking. They often can't help it. It's because they don't have the skills to handle adversity and frustration in a mature way. And D'Angelo is the same. And D'Angelo's behavior in court was his temper tantrum. And that was the true Joe D'Angelo. This was not faking, if that makes any sense. You know, that was that was truly him. I thought that's exactly what I would expect that kind of guy to be, a cowardly wimp. Well, I have to ask this question, and I know it will sound like I'm being flippant, but I'm really not. And I want to know if we ever found out if he had a tiny little penis. Gary, I don't know yeah. for sure. I don't well, know if that. what I'm saying. Well, I it really was an important know. characteristic. Yeah. It was an important characteristic. And I think, and you so know, And so many as... women indicated it was such. And I wonder exactly. how that was connected to his behavior and what he did and his feeling of being inadequate and, you know, insecure. Mm-hmm. I do think that played a part, you know, as simplistic and maybe cliche as it seems. It, it may very well be that this is where this all came from, this insecurity, you know, what I think was probably a significant abnormality. I don't think it's the sole reason he went out and did all this. I mean, I don't think we ever really know why people somehow combine violence with sex, but it happens. And I don't know if that explains everything, but, you know, I do think it played a part, you know, as simple an explanation as that might be. And I I never asked. You spent a lot of time on this case. And it sounds like even after you finished with the analysis and then left the unit, you still remain connected to this question of, you know, who this person was. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and what this case meant to you, you know, having worked on it? And then, as you said, you know, finding out on Twitter that he had been identified and arrested. Sure. I spent about two years, which is really nothing compared to what some of these investigators spent on this case, but I did immerse myself in it. It was a passion of mine. And I I think that all of the investigators, just like the public is fascinated with this case, all of the investigators really poured their lives into it. And I, I don't think I'm any different. And I have stayed connected to the case. I've stayed connected to many of the investigators that uh, worked on the case. And, and a lot of them are no longer on the case anymore, like me. And we, we still do talk about it. What means a lot to me is that growing up and you know going through school, I dreamed of working on something like this and being a part of this kind of case and investigation. And to get that opportunity as a brand new profiler, never thinking I'd ever even have a chance to even get into the unit, much less the FBI, to get to work on it, to participate and play a part. Profiles never <laughs> solve cases. It's, it's investigators. It's the investigation and, and old-fashioned investigative work that solved these cases. Profiles never do. But I do think they're useful. And I do think that they're helpful. And I do think that this analysis was helpful to clarify a lot of things for many of the investigators who had struggled with all these questions for so many years. You know, I will always be connected to this case. I will never forget the time I spent on it. I'll never forget the people that I met. 
while working on it. And I'll never forget the commitment. There were investigators, the working group meetings, the task force meetings. One of them came up to me and he was a first responder to the crime in Ventura in Orange County. And he came up to me and he said, I just want you to know, I was one of the first responders. I've been, you know, he'd been retired for many years and I'm here because I just hope someday this will get solved. So thanks for coming out. I just thought, man, he's been with this case since the day he walked in that house. All of these people that worked on it and all the family members who lost loved ones and all the victims or, you know, survivors of the sexual assaults, the men and women and the attempted sexual assaults. I'm just really glad that they have closure. That's why I've stayed connected. It is fascinating to talk to someone who has had the opportunity to see all of it, the crime scene photos, the victim statements, reports from all of these different territories and agencies, and look at them all together. And so your analysis is of the highest quality, I would say, because you've had that opportunity to put your hands on and your and your eyeballs on all of the data to do a uh, complete comparison and analysis. So this has been fantastic. Thank you. You know, it is true. There's a lot that's been reported in the media. And of course, you know, I had read almost all of it even before becoming involved in this investigation. And there's so much out there that isn't factual or true or didn't happen or it wasn't him. And to have the opportunity to say, okay, you know, what really did happen? Did he do this or did he do that? Not only read all the reports and look at the photo, the crime scene photos, but also talk to some of the investigators who were there at the crime scenes. And I can ask them, was this there? And they'd be like, no. Or, (laughs) you know, was this really a diamond knot? And, you know, there would be an investigator that would be able to answer those very specific questions. So I could kind of sort through all the rumors and all the misinformation that gets reported because one little thing could mess up an analysis. (laughs) Of his behavior. Like, you know, for instance, there is a letter out there that has been attributed to him in the media as as his, as if he wrote it to the police department. It's a poem and it's it's called Excitement's Crave. And, and it's been reported that he wrote it to the police department. And I was able to verify from one of the detectives that they know who wrote it It wasn't D'Angelo. It was somebody else who had sent similar letters over the past, you know, the many years prior that were very similar and they know it was him. So it wasn't D'Angelo. Well, that puts D'Angelo in a different light. He's not communicating with the police, such as, you know, the way that Dennis Rader (laughs) did. So taunting like on a TV movie, you know, he's not taunting them. He did not do that. Knowing that about him, okay, you know, that tells me something about his personality. Had he done that, that might tell me something else about his personality. But it was things like that that I was able to verify and you know read everything firsthand and, and make sure that I have all the facts right and not just what is reported in the media because things aren't always accurate, as you know. And so yeah. he ends up with multiple life sentences and is in jail now for the rest of his life. Yeah. In June of last year, D'Angelo pled guilty to 13 counts of first degree murder and 13 counts of kidnapping to commit rape. And these are part of the the murders. Um, And he received multiple life sentences. You know, the guilty plea was, you know, put into place so that he wouldn't get the death penalty. Unfortunately, due to told statutes of limitations, he was not charged with all the sexual assaults he committed. But as part of his plea agreement, he was required to admit to all of them in open court. And again, I want to point out like one of those 13 murder counts was Claude Snelling. He was included in those and the Maggiores as well. So cases that didn't involve the sexual assault, those were also included. So again, you know, it's it's nice to see those cases come to a close as well. Being an FBI profiler and and doing this behavioral analysis, are you able to still get comfort to know that you did hit some marks, even though what caught him had nothing to do with the analysis of his profile? How do you look at that? I always knew 
that it was going to be the science. I mean, this case was 25, 35 years old, some of them even older. I didn't go into it thinking that the profile I came up with was going to solve it. And I hoped it would be helpful in the sense of potentially interview strategies or prioritizing suspects, you know, something along those lines. I did have a case that was really important to me as well. It was the homicide of two little girls at age 11 and 13 in Oklahoma. And I had watched or I had followed the media on that and it happened in 2008. And then when I got to the unit, I saw that the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation was going to be referring the case to the BAU. So I was in the Crimes Against Adults unit, but as part of my training, I had to do an analysis for the Crimes Against Children unit. So I went down to that unit chief and I said, can I please do this case for my training? And he said, sure. And so I got assigned that case. I went out there, it was like May of 2011, I was out in Oklahoma, and I gave the profile. And then three months later, they arrest the guy. And it was a, you know, by this point, it's it's three years cold. And then they arrest the guy, and I get a call from the FBI agent who is in the RA. And he says, we've arrested someone, we, we think he's the killer, he fits the profile, he fits the profile. This guy had killed his girlfriend. And they arrested him and the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation lead detective was interviewing him. And he was also the lead detective on the homicide of the two little girls. And he's interviewing him. And he said, this guy fits the profile that Julia came up with for those two little, I think it's him. And so they call me and I said, well, I like how you're thinking, but you know, just because somebody does something bad here doesn't mean he did. They're two, you know, it's it's domestic violence. They're two different types of crimes. Let's not, but it turns out it was him, you know, and the, and they did with forensic evidence, they did connect him and he ultimately confessed to it. So did that solve it? No, I think they would have got there anyway, but you know, the light went on quicker, I guess, <laughs> to say like, oh, this could be him because he fits what they said. And, and I think that's what profiling can do. It can kind of help you prioritize suspects. But I, I think they were eventually, they would have eventually got there with him because they would have done a search warrant. They would have found shell casings. They would have said, hey, these shell casings match the ones at that other homicide. It eventually would have been solved that way. But I felt like the analysis just made it a little quicker. And I feel really good about that. Well, I want to thank you, Julia, for going through this case review. It was absolutely fascinating. I understand that the first two episodes of your new podcast, The Consult, will take a deeper dive into this particular case. Yes. So there were several people in the unit that worked on this case, and two people in particular. One was retired FBI crime analyst Alice Casey, and the other was retired supervisory special agent Bob Drew. So I will be talking with Bob Drew, and we're going to go deeper into the behavior exhibited by Joe D'Angelo, deeper into our profile. You'll hear some of Bob's opinions, and we'll discuss how we came to the conclusions that we came to. All right. So I want to remind everybody that I will have a link to your website where they can check out your brand new podcast, The Consult. Thank you. Well, we're at the point of the interview where I like to kind of go back to the very beginning and just find out from you when and why you joined the FBI. I joined the FBI in uh, 1999 And growing up, my mom was an avid true crime reader, and she was reading Helter Skelter. I don't know how old I was, but I was pretty young. Of course, that's about the Manson murders. And she told me I was too young to read the book. I wasn't allowed to read it, but I did anyway. I was hooked. After that, I became an avid true crime reader myself. I still am. Jerry, my friend has described me as the groupie who joined the band. (laughs) So I I follow everything. I follow cases in the media. But, you know, it was it was reading Helter Skelter that made me want to go into law enforcement. And somehow I knew at a young age, I wanted to try to help solve murders. I, I just knew I wanted to do that. You know, I was good in science. I was in majoring in chemistry. And I read the book, The Blooding, 
by Joseph Wamba, which is about the first use of DNA to solve a murder case. And after reading that, I knew I wanted to work in a crime lab. And I did that before joining the FBI, I worked with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab. You know, being part of that laboratory, I was also a member of the violent crime response team. So I went out and processed a lot of homicide scenes. And that was my favorite part of the job, going to the scenes and and studying them and collecting evidence and trying to determine what happened and what were the sequence of events. Always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, what kind of person would do this? You know, why why did this happen? And really always was was thinking that. And and I would always want to know, you know, I'd call the special agents who were in charge of the investigations and I'd say, did you catch him yet? Who is it? Can you tell me about him? And it was during that time while working in the lab and processing all these homicide scenes that I read Mindhunter by John Douglas. And I knew I wanted to be an FBI profiler. I, I just thought that's, I really want to do that. I want to take my science background and my knowledge of forensics and crime scenes and reconstruction of crime scenes. And I want to combine that with the behavior and, you know, see if I can help solve crimes in that way. So I did join the FBI to become an FBI profiler. And I do credit John Douglas with that. I'm sure a lot of FBI agents join the FBI because of his book. I would imagine so, yeah. So I, I do have a, a funny story about when I first got to BAU, there was an assignment, they were going to be archiving all the old case files, and they needed people to go read through them all and determine, okay, which ones are we going to keep here on site that were like historically significant, or these cases were so old. And I remember that being, you know, one of the newest people in the unit, I got selected to do that. Some people in the unit thought it was like a punishment. Oh, you poor thing, you've got to go read all these old files. It was fascinating, Jerry. I read old reports that John Douglas wrote and, and Wrestler and all the, the people who began in the unit. Actually, my unit chief was like, what are you taking so long for? And I said, I just get hooked on these. But I was able to see the evolution of behavioral analysis from the very first days up until how we do it now. And it was fascinating. I learned so much. And I, I really, you know, everybody else felt sorry for me having to go sit down there in that room. And it was, you know, an assignment of a lifetime for me. I, I loved it. And I learned a lot. And I took what I learned from there, you know, into my job as a profiler in the unit. But I, I learned a lot. It was it was fascinating. Whenever I'm interviewing an FBI profiler, we always like to stress that getting into the unit is very competitive and someone can't expect to join the FBI and become an FBI profiler because it's so difficult. So it is exciting to know that that was something that you wanted to do and that you were able to do it. Yeah. And I did join the FBI knowing that I might never get that opportunity, but I always tried to do things that would make me competitive for the unit, working on certain types of cases. And I became coordinator for the behavioral analysis unit out in the field so that I could be learning out in the field and have some exposure to the kinds of cases that they were working But early on in my career, I remember going and I, you know, I was on a white collar crime squad. At first, I was disappointed, but it turned out to be the best thing for me. I I think I really learned to be a good investigator. And really, that's the bottom line. To be qualified to get into the behavioral analysis unit, you just need to be a good investigator. The rest will come. But at first, I was a little disappointed. You know, I had experience in violent crime and I wanted to be on a violent crime squad. And I thought that's what I would need to do to get into the behavioral analysis unit. And I went and introduced myself to the violent crime supervisor at the time. And he looked at me and he's like, that's pretty scary stuff. And I thought, I don't think he's going to help me too much. (laughs) He doesn't think I should be here. So I just went about my way. I had been told, well, you can't be a coordinator because you're not on a violent crime squad. But I applied for it and I was selected to be the, the coordinator for the Boston division. And then I applied to the unit it was competitive to get in. And, you know, I was selected for the unit. I really couldn't believe it. I was a good student, wasn't the best student. I was in athletics, but I wasn't the best athlete. And I certainly 
not the most popular person. But what I do think and what I know about myself is I never gave up on anything. If someone told me no, I just found another way to do it. You know, okay, there's a, a roadblock there. How else can I get there? And I just found different ways. And, you know, I never looked at rejection as, you know, I got to give up. Okay, well, I got to figure out another way. That's how my entire career was. And I just was fortunate enough to to get in there. And I look back and I, I still can't believe it. I still cannot believe that things I dreamed about when I was a kid, I got to live a dream. That's almost like your last word but I'm sure you probably have more to say. So what is your last word? Well, I'll keep it short since I just rambled on for quite a bit, but I just think I was very fortunate. The FBI is full of so much talent and some of the people that I have worked with are the best people that I have ever known and I am honored to have been a part of it. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Julia Cowley. There are also a couple of photos of Joe D'Angelo from his arrest and from when he was a police officer. There's also a copy of the original Unknown Subject Wanted Flyer, as well as links to a multimedia FBI report on the case and other news articles. Don't forget, if you want to take an even deeper dive into this case, please check out Julia Cowley's podcast, The Consult. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. Make sure you follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books, and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series, features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. 